Welcome to the Daily Update. This is being prepared Tuesday, June 14th, where we'll look at the action in the market today and then see how things look for Wednesday, June 15th. And this is the big day. This is when the FOMC will come out with their announcement. That could be pretty critical. There's been a lot of changes just over the last few days of what the market is expecting will happen. Before that, we're likely to see pretty quiet action. The announcement will be made at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and then they'll make a statement, and the market will probably react to all of that. And then about 30 minutes later, there will be a press conference where Chairman Powell comes out and speaks, and then the markets will have a chance to react to that. It could be a pretty wild day because there's so much uncertainty right now. What I usually do during this time is I either go live, if people are interested in that, we can kind of watch all this together, or I just bring up a one-minute bar chart. I don't day trade, but sometimes it's kind of fun to watch things as they move. That's the reason for the 10-minute bar chart, just to get a feel for what's happening. In tomorrow's video, I'll go ahead and post that one-minute bar chart if it turns out to be something exciting. All right, let's go back and talk about what happened on Tuesday. Right at the open, it was slightly positive. We had so many down moves from Thursday, Friday to Monday. It was kind of nice to see an open that wasn't really gapping. And we saw some initial buying that took us up to the daily pivot at about 37.74. As the day went on, prices drifted down to S1, which was at about 37.10. Going into the close, prices rebounded and tried to get back up to the unchanged level, but just were not quite able to do that. We ended up being down 0.38%. Still a down day, but not as much as what we've been seeing recently. Volume was above average. We're currently fixated on a negative technical picture. On many levels, it's oversold, short term, intermediate term, but it might still have more room to go. The big focus right now, and that's what I have in gold here, is inflation and interest rates, which are producing growth concerns. We have the FOMC meeting that will be happening on Wednesday. Everybody's talking about that. Different geopolitical concerns and then earnings as they come out. So let's go back and talk about what are some things that we can take away from Tuesday. The current possible Fed scenario, and this has switched just over the last few days, where it was looking like the Fed was going to increase half a percent at today's meeting and then half a percent in July. And then we'll just have to see what happens in September. The current scenario, possible scenario, is that there'll be a 0.75% increase on Wednesday and then another three quarters of a percent increase in July and then a half a percent in September. That's kind of what we're running with right now. So after we finish with the September meeting, we'll be at two and three quarters to 3%. Now, please understand, this can change quickly. Just a few days ago, there was a different scenario. A week ago, there was an even different scenario. So this can change all the time as each day goes by. Fear is pretty extreme still. There are real concerns about a recession. You have some people that are, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And other people that are very dogmatic saying, yes, we're going to head into a recession. But there's a lot of concerns about that nonetheless. The economic reports that were released, we had the NFIB Small Business Optimism Index. And it really didn't decline. You'd think people are not very optimistic right now. It had been 93.2, it declined to 93.1. That's not really a big market mover. The big report was the PPI, and it showed that final demand increased 0.8, which was as expected. Even though that's still pretty high, it didn't go above or below what the market was already expecting. The index for final demand when you take out food and energy, it rose 0.5%, which was actually a little bit less than the expected 0.6%. Then on a year-over-year -year basis, demand was up 10.8% versus 10.9% that we had last month. And the index for final demand taking out food and energy was up 8.3% against what we saw in April at 8.6%. The condition of our trend continues to be negative. Our bias is negative and our momentum is negative. And again, if you're new to watching these videos, 
bias is usually up day, down day. So if we had an up day, usually the bias will be positive. Down day, usually it will be negative. Momentum is just kind of an eyeball look back over the last two, three, four, five days to get a general idea. So let's go back and talk about the day session. We are currently back into extreme fear territory. We have dropped down below 25 now in showing some extreme fear. Is this going to be like last time where we camped out here for a long period of time? What we usually see are V bounces where everybody freaks out and then we bounce up out of this. We usually don't sit down in this area for a long time. Another thing that we're starting to see as prices are coming down, there's been a real increase in the share buyback authorization announcements. And this is as of June 3rd. So it's a little bit old now, but it just shows that the buybacks that have been authorized have risen to a higher level than what we've seen in an awful long time. And this can be positive for the market. If a company is buying back their own stock, they should have some confidence in it and that'll help boost up the price when they buy and it'll also take some of the shares out of the market which makes them more precious and that can help the price go up as well. This just shows that there's now getting to be a real concern about stagflation. That's what we had back in the 70s. They're really worried that we're going to have ultra high inflation without economic growth. And so it remains the popular economic background. So which of the following do you think best describes the global economy over the next 12 months? As of June 2022, they really think below trend growth and above trend inflation. This came from Yardeni's website. This just shows how the personal saving rate has really declined. As we've come out of the COVID plunge and things get a little more difficult with the economy shut down, now we're having more difficulty with inflation. So this has really been declining. The expectations are just showing, this is kind of a different way of looking at this. There's the consumer optimism index and it's going down. That's the one in red. The consumer confidence index, that's the one in green over here. And that's a little harder to see. And then the consumer sentiment index is the blue one. And it's just showing that overall people are not as optimistic, confident, or sentimentally in love with what's going on in the markets right now or in the economy. This came out from Rydex. This is the bear bull ratio. It shows that we're spiking up a little bit as we had the down days, but not necessarily extreme right now. This is showing the conference board's CEO confidence. And that's over here on the left. That's the dark blue. This is how confident our CEOs about things. Over on the right hand side is the scale for the year over year profits. And you can see where there's a pretty strong correlation between the two. When confidence is higher, they make more money. When confidence declines, they make less money. The VIX, after spiking up both on a closing basis and seeing this gap on the bar chart, it actually declined a little bit, even with the down day. And here's the VIX of the VIX, which also is picking up steam, but did not exceed yesterday's high. And we actually closed a little bit lower on the line chart. The RSI 9 period that I plot on here, it's coming back down after giving us an extreme reading. Ulcer index continues to advance. We're down 22.12% from the all-time high. The equity put call ratio just on a daily basis actually declined. But when we look at the five period average, it is still advancing and starting to get pretty high. What have drawdowns been like over the last five years? And I put this red line down here and the yellow line. It just shows back in 2017, this was as far as the drawdowns went. These are the declines that we saw from some kind of a high, usually the all-time high. This was the COVID plunge right in here and how we bounced up off of that. This shows that we're getting pretty extreme right now. We're down 21.8%. So we could go lower than this, but this just gives us some perspective of what has happened in the past versus where we're at right now. Looking at some earnings, Yardeni was posting a lot of different earnings things. And this is the operating earnings per share, the forward and actual. So the forward is the red line, and that's usually on top because they're looking forward and that's more optimistic where the blue line is of the reality 
But it just shows how earnings, both on a forward basis and an actual basis, have been increasing. But this is lagging here. This is the first quarter of 2022. This also shows that by the end of 2022, based on the earnings per share and PE scenarios, if we are at 18 times earnings, based on these earnings levels right here, the current level is at 17 times earnings. So by the end of 2022, looking into 2023, we would be at 4150 with the S&P. If we get very inexpensive and we really suffer earnings being reduced and we get down to a 14 times earnings ratio, that would put us down at 3150. This also compares different PE ratios. And I have a chart that I show in the weekly video where I use the 20, the 15, and the 10, where this chart is just breaking it down, 22, 20, 18, 16, 14, and just shows where these different PE ratios are in relation to the current price. Now, SK, that's South Korea. Their exports are declining right now, and it may mean lower profits in the S&P. The dark blue line just shows exports from South Korea. These are the earnings per share on a year-over-year -year basis for the S&P, and they seem to have a strong correlation. The dividend yield has been very, very low. As prices have been going up, the dividend yield goes down. As the S&P has been declining, it's been going back up. And at the time this chart came out, we were at 1.64%. Looking again at P.E. ratios, they're using trailing earnings here, which is what I use on the charts that I usually show, where these darker lines are using forward-looking earnings from 1979 to now. And it just shows that as price has been coming down and earnings have been holding up so far, overall the P.E. ratio has been declining also. This also kind of shows the same thing, a little bit more current, where as of the 13th, how we've been declining with our overall forward-looking P.E. ratio. And if you look over here to the side, we're just under 16. So that would be more fairly valued. We're at 15.7 as of the time of this chart. Looking at some support resistance, I'm switching some charts around in here. Where we did drop below S1, we still have S2 below our current prices, which is at 35.86. Here are some standard pivot points that might serve as support or resistance. The other red pivot points here are the DeMarc pivot points. The green ones are based on Fibonacci measurements. This is the machine gun chart just showing different areas. And a lot of times we use Fib levels. We can also go back to previous lows that will often provide a support level. And these are just all the different FIB levels. I tried to take a lot of the other stuff off of here. And I know this is a very hard to read chart. I'm not quite sure how to do this while still providing a big picture at the same time. There's a little cleaner one which shows going back to the low that we set in 2021. This is currently acting as support. We closed right above that after going just a little bit below that. But if we break down below it, that would be some pretty significant support that we've been able to break or that the market has broken. The other chart is just showing how we're dropping down below these two FIB levels that are right on top of each other. And the next level down here is at about 3514. The weekly chart also shows how we're still below some pretty long-term support going from the COVID low to the all-time high. FedWatch. Everything switched over the last few days. The current rate is three quarters of a percent to a percent. That's the range that they have. And now there's a 98.4% chance that we will be at one and a half to one and three quarters. That's 75 basis points higher than we are right now. And then here's the corresponding chart and to show how that's changed. Then in July, they're suggesting that we will be at two and a quarter to two and a half, and there's a 90% chance that will happen. And then we're looking more at the two and three quarters to 3% scenario right now after we get through the September meeting. And here's the corresponding chart. 
This is just showing again the, the spread between the two-year treasury and how it's really been spiking up. The blue line here is the treasury yield, and that's what I watch the most, and that's what I use for the possible positive scenario. The green line is the Fed funds rate 12 months forward futures. They're looking out into the future, and right now they're suggesting that the two years is going to continue to climb. And then way down here on the bottom, this is the Fed funds target rate. This is what they're at right now. They need to raise this up. This is just showing there's a huge spread between where interest rates are at and where the Fed has them. These should be much closer to each other because they tend to move together with each other. Well, they're not doing that right now. Another look at the futures looking at 12 months just shows a real increase. Six months, those are also increasing. Three months. So this is just showing that they're projecting higher interest rates into the future. Looking at some inflation things, this can be kind of a hard chart to figure out. There's all these colors here and lines and different meanings. Basically, the takeaway I had from this is 5% inflation precedes recessions and deflation. Well, we're at up over 8.5%. We're at 8.6% inflation right now. So it would not necessarily be surprising based on historical precedents that we could go into a recession. Looking at our different sectors, utilities were down the most, followed by staples. The ones that were up, we had energy and tech. Actually, we're up on the day. And here's how they perform since the all-time high. Technical alerts, a little smaller list, actually a couple of positive ones. When the NASDAQ went above 10.9, there was a BPI cross in the materials sector. The S&P set another 52-week low. Canada is having a little trouble. They're setting a 52-week low, and for a while there, oil has now crossed below 120. This is the overnight session, and I'm trying to take a screenshot of this, where this was the new trading day here, and these are the overnight futures that trade. And I keep an eye on that pretty much all the time. And then right down over in here is where we had the open of the session in New York. I refer to this quite a bit in the videos, but I thought it might help you to have a picture of this. And this is freely available to you. I go to investing.com. Here's their website. You look at the US 500 futures and this is freely available. You don't have to log in. You don't have to pay anything. It's out there and available for you. Here's the intraday chart showing how gapped up a little bit to the upside. We were able to get up to the pivot. Then we came back down and kind of danced along the unchanged level for a while. Dropped down, tried to come back up. That wasn't happening. Went all the way down to S1. Tried to come back up to almost unchanged again. And then saw a little bit of weakness. So this is like an itty bitty little trading day compared to what we've been seeing over the last few days. Typically, what will happen on Fed days is we'll have some gyration at the open. The markets will settle down and go sideways to slightly up, waiting for the announcement to come out, and then the markets will go all over the place. Here's another look at some intraday support and resistance levels that you might find useful. And I use this on a 10-minute chart. Some people like a 30-minute chart, a 60-minute chart. Other people might use different charts, like a 23 and a third minute chart for some reason. It seems to me that the pivot levels that are produced on the 10 minute chart seem to be the most helpful. That's what a lot of the program trading or algorithms use as part of their decision making process. Technical overview, no changes here. If you've been watching the videos for any length of time, but then we look at all the different stocks and bonds and sectors and even cryptos and these continue to be negative our trend has really started to cross above 20 with the red line on top so we are now in a negative trend the arun's kind of acting a little funny right now the one thing that is true about this is the red line is all the way pegged at the top that means sellers are in control the surprise from yesterday's reading was we saw an increase in this green line, which really doesn't seem justified. It declined a little bit, so our oscillator overall is declining and below zero. But I wouldn't put a lot of stock, pardon the pun, 
into this chart right now because it's not really reflecting what's happening. Looking at our breadth, after having a couple of pretty extreme down days, we've bounced up out of that and are a little bit more neutral now. The new highs, new lows continue to decline based on price and volume. The advanced decline ratio is starting to get extreme negative. The new highs, new lows are trending lower. And we're starting to get a little bit extreme with the new highs and new lows. We could still go lower than this, but this is a pretty negative reading right now. Taking a 10-day average, we've also dropped below this 50 line, which is kind of the separation between positive and negative. Accumulation distribution is still showing continued weakness. The stocks above their 50 period moving average, this is starting to get extreme. And to me, a 50 is intermediate term to even long term. So other times when we reach this level, you can look up here to see that that sometimes will mark a significant bottom in the S&P. Stocks below their 200 day moving average, that's much longer term. It continues to decline, is not necessarily extreme, but just the fact that it's getting weaker just shows the follow through weakness. Short term charts, the decision point, they're pretty much all negative now across the board, except for their intermediate term trend model. The rate of change is looking a little bit better. Things slowed down more on Tuesday. Going back five periods, we're still extreme negative. The force index bounced up a little bit, but we're still pretty extreme right now. 10 period also pretty extreme. This is just saying that we're still oversold. Swinland trading oscillator, extreme based on price and volume. McClellan oscillator, also extreme negative. Stoke RSI, extreme negative. Williams percent R, extreme negative. 20 period moving average study, extreme negative with the 20 and the 50 and declining on the 200 and starting to get extreme. The stochastics are extreme negative on the short term basis, intermediate term basis, and rolling over on the long term basis. We're still getting kind of far away from the mean price. So we're deviating away from that. And this acts like a rubber band. If it gets too far away, we tend to see it come back. The Sean trend meter remains extreme negative. The CCI 14 is extreme, as is the 20. The chicken oscillator continues to decline and still has some more room to go before it's extreme. Chicken money flow is looking more negative. Ease of movement is also declining, even though it turned up a little bit on a one day basis. Volume has been picking up as we've been going down, so that's why we're seeing this indicator turning up. The vortex is still negative with the red line on top. Summation index based on price and volume are negative. Our short and intermediate term oscillators are negative with the slope and the MACD, the PMO and the TSI. Our longer term ones, the KST and the TRIX, they're weakening but they have not crossed over yet. The BPI is getting extreme negative. PMO is negative across the board. PMO study, extreme negative with those that are rising as well as with the buy signals and really negative with those that are above zero. The rate of change on a 50 period basis is looking rather extreme negative. The boom indicator, looking back on the 50 period moving average, is still extreme negative, And we're still fairly negative with the 200. Connor's RSI, trying to bounce up a little bit after giving an extreme negative reading. And this is a longer term chart because I wanted to show you how this anchored moving average had been providing some pretty good support. And this is kind of a cool little trick. Instead of just plotting a 50 period moving average, you can actually attach this to a significant high or low. And then quite often that will provide pretty solid support levels. TTM squeeze continues to be negative and declining. And we dropped below the moving average here as well. Percent B, after giving us a little bit of an extreme negative reading, is now trying to bounce. RSI in nine periods is extreme, where we still have some more room to follow with the 14. Different charts, the Heiken Ashi is negative, Kegi is negative, Renko is negative. We're still looking at a double bottom breakdown, but there were no new circles or X's drawn in the point and figure chart. 
three line break is also redrawing to look even more negative. We're negative with the elder's impulse looking at the S&P as well as the SPY. The SAR still has the dots on top, so that's negative. The go no go system is negative with the dark purple. Longer term, we're really extended on the 50 period simple moving average. We're still declining on the 150 and the 200. Special K is starting to turn down again, and it never did really turn positive. The broad market, the diamonds are negative, as are the Qs. The Vixen declined a little bit on a closing basis, but we're spiking up overall, and there's a real gap in here right now. Looking at the broad market, the dollar was pretty much unchanged, but it's gone back and surpassed this previous high. So I've taken that other spike chart out of here that we've been looking at. And this just shows how the dollar's been going up as the S&P has been going down. And they have a really solid inverse relationship. Oil declined down to 118.93. Still very high, but at least it's not as high as it was. The correlation actually turned up a little bit between the S&P and oil. The gold futures were down a percent in the futures contract and down 0.8% in the ETF. And this is one of the things that's really mystifying a lot of folks. They think gold should be going up, and it's just not. There's the long-term chart. And silver is just having a lot of trouble now, too. And here's the long-term chart of that. The euro has been really declining compared to the dollar, where the euro's at 104.14, the dollar's at 104.95. And then this just shows the Japanese yen, the euro, and the dollar compared to each other. Bitcoin is now still breaking down. And when I looked before I started recording, I think we were down into the 21s. So we're just seeing a lot of real carnage here. And if you know charting patterns, that should not necessarily be a surprise. We have a head and shoulders pattern here. And then inside of the bigger pattern, we have smaller patterns. So the fact that we're really breaking down here should not necessarily be a surprise if you use technical analysis. Bonds. The corporate bonds continue to decline based on price. We are declining based on the bond ETF. And on a world basis, we're just really dropping down. And we're getting back down here to retesting or getting down to the COVID lows. The 10-year yield continues to really break out. So we have broken above this resistance. This is the resistance that I'm talking about here. I just wanted to provide a little longer looking chart. 30 year yield is also breaking out to the upside. And then we have some yield curves that are inverted. The two to the 10 is not inverted, although it's getting really close. The 10 to the three month is fine. The 30 to the five is inverted. The 10 to the five is inverted. And the 10 to the Fed funds rate is holding up okay. The correlation between the S&P and the 10-year yield is also showing as interest rates go up, stocks go down. Tech to the 10-year is also very strong inverse relationship. And we're just seeing a real spike up in U.S. yields. And internationally, we're also seeing a real trend to the upside, except for Japan. And most of our possible positive scenarios, they're kind of off the table right now. The two-year yield continues to spike with really no end in sight right now. Now, that could change quickly. If the markets really start to go up and interest rates go down, we might spike. But we were working off this other little spike down here. That's pretty much gone now. And the correlation between the S&P and the two-year yield is also showing a really strong inverse relationship. The small camp index also saw a decline. And when we compare the ratio, it went up a little bit. So overall, the small caps are outperforming the S&P 500, but both are having a lot of trouble right now. So this is not necessarily viable. We're seeing a decline in this little itty bitty spike right here. The staples also were down over a percent. And this is still looking okay. This may not necessarily be an ultimate spike. But if we continue to go higher and take out this spike, then this spike that we've been using would then become negated. The Copic curve, that's off now. We've dropped back below the moving average. The mass index, we've generated this signal 
in late May and it hasn't really done anything except go lower, but we weren't seeing a lot of confirmation on that. So this is pretty much not on the table now. The praying bottom fissure is rolling over. It could still turn back up, but it gave us a signal. We bounced up a little bit here, but then are going down ever since then. So what's our outlook then? The technicals are negative and oversold. Sentiment is extreme, meaning lots and lots of fear. We have the weekly mortgage applications report coming out. And then the ones in blue, these are the biggies. Retail sales will be coming out. And then we have the FOMC rate decision. And that'll be at 2 p.m. I think I said 11 a.m. I'm used to West Coast time. Should be 2 p.m. And then after that, there'll be a press conference that everybody's going to be tuned in to watching. Geopolitical events. Russia, Ukraine hasn't changed. China, with their lockdowns still kind of continuing, that could hurt the supply chain, inflation and interest rates, growth concerns. As we go down, you might see more margin call concerns. Oil earnings will get a lot of Fed speak today and then the longer term scenario in Japan. So our scenarios were negative for all the reasons that I said. And today we'll probably have a lot to do with how the market reacts to the FOMC decision and then what they say. Because our technicals are really negative but could be oversold. To help things go up, we are in an oversold condition which may produce some kind of a bounce. There's also a real disbelief and a lot of pessimism right now. And there could be a positive reaction to whatever the FOMC says or does. Possible positive scenarios. The only one that's really looking okay right now is the staples spike. And if we see staples going up more, that could even be taken off the table. The technicals are just not helpful right now. So we look to pivot points. We try to get back to some short-term moving averages. We use FIB levels. And then other lows that I showed in that one chart, they may provide some kind of support or resistance. And we're not sideways because the ADX is above 20 and it is negative. So our conclusion, the S&P is negative. Short term, negative, oversold. Intermediate term, negative, oversold. Long term, negative. So thank you. Have a good day on Wednesday. And we'll see what happens with the Fed and their announcement. And we'll just... Kind of watch what happens and then I'll report on it in the next video.